Hello and welcome. This is Leanne McGlynn with McGlynn Institute Neonatal. Today in our procedural skills series, we will discuss endotracheal intubation. Although endotracheal intubation is being used less and less today, it is still a vital skill to know how to perform correctly to ensure the safety in our neonatal population. There are many indications for the use of endotracheal intubation. One is when prolonged positive pressure is required to relieve upper airway obstruction, to provide a route for elective bronchial ventilation, to obtain direct tracheal cultures, to assist in bronchial hygiene when there is a diaphragmatic hernia suspected, or to provide a patent airway during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. While using a meconium aspirator during endotracheal intubation, the ET tube can be used as a rigid large bore suction catheter to remove thick meconium or other airway secretions. Additionally, endotracheal intubation is the final step in securing an airway in Mr. SOPA used in NRP. Finally, endotracheal intubation can be used as a route to instill surfactant. The key to properly performing endotracheal intubation is to know your landmarks. Once entering and looking at the glottis, you will see that there's a vallecula where you place your blade, the epiglottis, which is the covering over the trachea to prevent aspiration. You have your vocal folds or vocal cords, your glottis of which the tube will enter, and then below all of that is your esophagus. Keep in mind that the vocal cords may be open, moving, or shut. The esophagus can also look as if it's opening and closing as well. So the performer must know each of these landmarks in order to properly perform endotracheal intubation. Knowing your landmarks becomes even more important when your view is blocked. You can see in the top left, grade one, you have your epiglottis, your vocal cords, everything is well seen. Then as you shift to the right, grade two, you cannot even see the vocal cords, you only can see the epiglottis and a little bit of the glottis. As you go into grade three, you see a huge epiglottis and know that you would need to pass under it and up. And then finally, grade four is essentially a blind view. When preparing to perform endotracheal intubation, it is important that you gather the right equipment and supplies. This includes the laryngoscope handle and correct blade size. A Miller blade or a straight blade sizes double zero to one, depending on the gestation and weight. You'll also need endotracheal tubes. This also depends on size and gestation. 2.5 up to a 4.0. These are all uncuffed. You'll need a stylet if needed. You'll also need the adhesive type per your unit protocol, suction and suction catheters, an inflation bag and mask connected to oxygen, such as Neo-T, Neo-Puff, or a simple anesthesia bag or a self-inflating bag. It's also helpful to have a stethoscope, you may consider rapid sequence intubations per your unit protocol, and you'll also need a CO2 detector or a PD cap. Remember, purple is poor and gold is golden. So you may be asking why an uncuffed tube? Well, remember the shape of a neonate's trachea. The funnel-shaped larynx is the narrowest part of the cricoid. It only measures four to 5.5 millimeters. Therefore, it acts as a natural cuff, and you could cause necrosis should you have a cuffed tube inflated, especially one that is not checked correctly. Therefore, the typical ET tube in the neonatal population is an uncuffed ET tube. If non-emergent and time permits, consider using rapid sequence intubation per your unit protocol. This typically includes atropine given to control secretions and prevent 
reflex bradycardia. Then additionally, you can use fentanyl or morphine for pain control. Finally, you can consider the use of a paralytic such as rocuronium. Again, refer to your unit's protocol for the use of rapid sequence intubation. Now that you've gathered your equipment and supplies and you have pre-medicated per your unit protocol, it is time to check your equipment. First, you'll check your blade by placing the blade on the laryngoscope handle as seen here to see that the light is working. Next, you'll gather your CO2 detector and make sure it is ready for use and have it at the bedside. After you've gathered your blade and CO2 detector, you'll then want to prep your ET tube. Should you want a stylet, then you'll take the stylet and place it down the ET tube. Once this is done, you'll want to make sure that that stylet is folded over the top and that it does not stick out the bottom, nor does it stick out past the Murphy's eye. Once that's done, you can then take your ET tube with stylet and set it next to the patient. You'll then want to suction the patient, whether it be with a suction catheter or a neonatal Yonkers, as seen here. Next, you'll want to pre-oxygenate and pre-ventilate your patient, making sure their heart rate and oxygenation saturations are within acceptable ranges. Now, while standing at the head of the bed, you'll want to take the laryngoscope in your left hand and slowly place the blade within the mouth, advancing slowly until you begin to see landmarks that you recognize. As you slowly adjust your blade forward or backwards, you shall see those landmarks start to fall into place as you do here. You'll see the epiglottis and the vocal folds. At this point, you then take your ET tube and advance under the epiglottis through the vocal cords until the two black marks on the ET tube are seen at the vocal cords. At this point, you stop advancing your ET tube. At this point, you can carefully remove your blade while holding the tube in place. You secure it against the gum line while removing your stylet, and now you can begin to ventilate. You'll look for chest rise, as well as increase in heart rate, and change in the color on the PD cap to golden. It's now time to check breath sounds in all four quadrants, making sure they are equal, adjusting your tube as needed. Also listen over the epigastrum, making sure there are no sounds there. You can now secure your tube per unit protocol. There are several methods for measuring tube depth. One is by measuring the newborn's nasal tragus length and adding one cm. That's where the tube would end up at the lip. Number two is adding six plus the weight in kilos. So if they're one kilo plus six, it would be seven at the lip which also brings us to the 789 rule, which is, seems to be a very accurate way. If they're one kilo, it's seven, two kilos, eight CMs at the lip, and three kilos, nine CMs at the lip. The ultimate is that on chest X-ray, it's between T1 and T2 as seen here. As you look for the tip of the ET tube on chest X-ray, you'll wanna make sure that it is at least two CMs above the carina. Proper ET tube placement will help prevent right main stem intubations and eventual pneumothoraces. Besides main stem intubation, you can also have esophageal intubations, laryngeal trauma or edema, bronchospasm, as well as accidental extubation. When troubleshooting an ET tube, make sure to use the dope mnemonic, displacement, obstruction, pneumo, or equipment. Now it's your turn. Tell us how this video helped you in your actual clinical practice. Looking for an NRP, procedural skills, or simulation-based training course? McGlynn Institute Neonatal has you covered. Give us a call or text at 704-728-4961 or email Dr. McGlynn at drmcglynn at mcglynninstitute.com. Look forward to hearing from you soon.